Um, hi, everyone, um, and welcome to Helping STEM Students Thrive, our January edition. And just to let you know, um, as you may have heard, the meeting is being recorded and we'll share the link out um, after the meeting is over. So I'm Patrice Persevia Fresco. I'm the Associate Director Learning Design at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And this is our third year that um, in collaboration with the University of Buffalo, we've been leading these sessions. And at University at Buffalo, we um, are part of the Women in STEM Cooperative. And the goal of this online series is to just help share out some um, research and practices that other people across the globe are using, and also help you develop a sense of community and um, share your questions and challenges that you're having. And as you enter, if you haven't already, it would be great if you could introduce yourself. And if you want, share a question or challenge that you have or something that you're interested in. And we also ask that you do mute your microphones during the session. Um, but we do encourage you to post questions and turn your microphone on um, if you want to join the conversation at some point to ask a question directly to one of our speakers. So today's focus is on adult learning pathways of fully online learning experiences. And we um, currently have um, over 140 colleagues that are registered for this series. They represent 56 institutions of higher education, um, eight organizations um, from across four countries, one territory, and people across 25 states. And a little bit about the Women in STEM Cooperative. It consists of a group of volunteers who are dedicated to advancing women in STEM in our respective communities. And this series is our attempt to address some of the systemic challenges and opportunities with improving STEM success. And in addition to sharing our, our knowledge, one of our goals for this series is to provide a space for you to interact with one another online. So again, I really encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to meet some new colleagues and interact with other people. Um, today, we are really excited to have several guests join us. Um, our first speaker today will be um, Andy Salterelli. He is Senior Director Evaluation Research and of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning at Stanford University. And he will be sharing some research that he's been doing around cues and des design decisions that we make in online courses and that how that can um, support women as they're studying some STEM courses. And then we have four, a total of four speakers from University at Buffalo. Bina Rama Murthy, um, is the P Chancellor's Award winner for Excellence in Teaching 2019, Teaching Associate Professor in Computer Science and Engineering. Um, and she's been working on a blockchain MOOC in Coursera, and she's gonna be sharing some experiences with us around that. And then we have Lisa Stevens, who is Assistant Dean for Digital Education at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Sabrina Kasucci, Program Director, Engineering Management and Amy Moore, Research Scientist, Center for Industrial Effectiveness. Um, and they are all at University at Buffalo and together worked on a um, management engineering MOOC that they're going to talk with us about. And just to let you know, our next session will be February 19th, um, the same time, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And we will be featuring um, some speakers talking about women's experiences at the undergraduate level. And we have two speakers scheduled right now, Jean Chrisman, who is at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and Sarah Bunnell, who is at UMass Amherst. And we will be sharing out some additional information on that discussion soon. And so right now, I would like to uh, turn it over to Andy. All right. Thank you, Patrice. Thanks for, for having me. It's, it's nice to be with you all. Um, I have uh, a few slides that I'll share about uh, our work in uh, creating welcoming or inclusive online learning uh, experiences. Some of this will be specific to women in STEM and then some of it's uh, more to underrepresented minorities uh, as well. So I'm going to share these slides, but feel free if you have questions and there will be probably a couple times I ask, uh, ask some questions, feel free to, to put your responses in the chat. Patrice, um, always stop me and happy to to address anything that's going on there. All right, can everyone see uh, this first slide? 
that look good? Okay, good. So I, I just want to also introduce you to uh, a dear colleague and friend, uh, Renee Kazilchek, whose hands uh, are in uh, almost all of this uh, work that I'll also talk about. He's an assistant professor of information science at Cornell, Cornell and I uh, very much en encourage you to follow his work as well. So I want to just uh, start with a very basic premise. How do I know, how do you know, how do learners know uh, whether they're welcome in an online learning environment? What types of information, what cues and in, in various things about the social context help me to know whether this is a place uh, that I am welcome, that someone like me can belong, and someone like me can be um, uh, successful. So, uh, with that basic question in mind, I want to I, I want to start. Let's see, with a, a intro activity. Uh, so, if we could just take two to three minutes, um, you can either do it by going to the website that uh, I have here or you can just follow along with this one simple slide. Now, if you go to the website, I promise you we are not taking any of your data. We don't want your data. It's a flat file. Um, so I don't, you don't hear that a lot, but we don't want your data. Um, but we do want you to do the activity because you'll, it'll become clear why in, in a few minutes. So very basic. Uh, on the left side, you see a, a, a list of values or qualities. Pick two or three of these qualities that are most important to you, and then answer one or a combination of these two questions on the right. How does attending this webinar reinforce your most important values, and or how can you gain strength from the fact that attending reinforces uh, your most important values? So just take, we'll take one or two minutes. Um, again, you don't have to enter it in the website if you don't want, you can put it on paper and pencil, but just take a minute to think about this, um, and, then, and then we'll move on. All right, I know that wasn't a lot of time, but we'll continue and just keep these things in mind. And, and again, it'll become clear in a few moments. <clears throat> um, so I wanna start with another very basic premise that, that learners come into an online learning experience trying to get from A to B, right? And so, but B can be many, many things, right? It can be a full, full degree, accredited degree. It can be a micro-credential. It can be appreciation for a skill or touching up on a skill that you need to use, uh, you know, just in time for your profession. And uh, unfortunately, there are barriers that keep students from getting from, from A to B. And um, in a lot of ways, we know a lot about these, these barriers, uh, especially instructional design and learning designers, things like uh, bad UI or in videos, uh, learning objectives that aren't clear or aren't aligned with uh, the content and the assessments. Um, maybe there are structural barriers like internet access, language, um, margin in one's life to do um, lifelong learning, right? All of those things are important barriers. And thankfully, there's a whole profession of instructional design and others, uh, and we'll hear about others in this session about how they're bringing down those barriers with online learning uh, experiences and those sorts of things. And so we won't, I, I won't spend my time talking about that, but what I wanna posit to you today is that there's another set of barriers um, that are a little, less uh, visible and that they're psychological uh, in nature. And unfortunately, many of these barriers are unequally distributed in uh, the population and uh, disproportionately affect un underrepresented minorities, women in, in male dominated STEM disciplines um, and the like. Now, if there are psychological barriers as, as we posit in our work, we should probably look to the psychological literature and theory to um, help find solutions. And so thankfully we have 
uh, a number of minority researchers who have developed over the last couple of decades uh, a good understanding of some of these processes. And now we won't spend a lot of time getting into it, but there are two main psychological processes that can become barriers for certain learners coming into a learning environment. One is social belonging uncertainty, uncertainty about belonging in a situation because of one's social group. Our attachment to a social group and having a positive image of that group is very important uh, to our identity um, and, and lots of specific processes and environments that make us uncertain about belonging in a, in a situation can be deleterious, as we'll talk about in a minute, to lots of outcomes, including educational outcomes. The other process um, made semi-famous by Claude Steele's Whistling Vivaldi book, um, fear of being seen as less capable because of one's social group. And we know not only, these, these are perceptions, right? Uh, often, sometimes it's overt um, racism or bias, but often it's subtle cues, you know, things like v whistling Vivaldi and how that might feel, whether I'm welcome here or not, I recognize that or not, right? That's a pretty subtle cue that might raise these concerns and they're perceptual. But what the research is clear on is that it affects important things about the learning process like cognition, like working memory, knowledge acquisition, persistence, and motivation. Worrying about belonging and feeling like uh, my identity is threatened in this space has real uh, implications for things we care about in learning. And we know now that they contribute to major academic achievement gaps for African Ameri American students, first generation, lower SES students, in women in historically male-dominated STEM programs. Okay, this is all in you know research that's done in face-to-face -face environments. We know the processes quite well, and we know some of the the um, solutions. But the question is, do these um, function the same in online spaces and fully online spaces where there's not a, often not a lot of social interaction? There's a lack of social cues in some sense, um, and also we've seen. Maybe uh, online learning is a way to, is a solution, right? And so, so the early heady days of um, MOOC rhetoric, um, you know, maybe claim to, to solve most of these issues, right? There are no race, color, ethnicity, um, you know, sex barriers now to education. Now, again, to, to be fair to not Agarwal, CEO of edX, these were pretty early days. This is June, 2013. And just to do some equal opportunity trolling, um, you know, Coursera still, you know, this, this is a very noble um, tagline. We envision a world where anyone, anywhere can transform their life by accessing the world's best learning experience. And the, the UN uh, Declaration of Uni Universe, uh, Human Rights, higher education shall be accessible, accessible to everyone, to all. And the question, you know, for us is access enough to bring down these barriers, whether it was the, the design, instructional design type bar barriers, uh, sort of infrastructure barriers, or the psychological barriers. And we started looking at this uh, in some of the early days of MOOCs and found, in fact, no, we were just perpetuating uh, the existing gaps for learners. Um, now, in this study, 55 MOOCs, 1.8 million people, a distinct correlation between the country from where from which someone uh, is learning and their persistence and completion rates. Those in high developed countries are almost twice as likely to um, uh, complete a course than those in low developed countries as measured by the, the Human Development Index. And so I, I, I'll stop here for a second and I'll just ask you, what do you think are the factors um, that contribute to this to this gap? Go ahead and put those those in the chat. and maybe we can have just a brief conversation about why, why this might be. And Patrice, feel free to um, read any of them. So we have, uh, we have Wi-Fi, bandwidth, and access to technology, difficulty of living, values that culturally reinforce the learning. Uh, global North ideology, education practices, self-efficacy, time to devote to, to learning, Maslow's hierarchy of need, language proficiency, economic. Yeah. Excellent. You, you, you got so many of them there in, in, in one or two comments. That's excellent. Yes, absolutely. There are 
you know, whether it's economic, the margin to, again, engage in lifelong learning, to language barriers, to internet access barriers, to, you know, inability to have mobile access to the content, to epistemological issues of sort of the Western epistemologies of, of these courses affecting those in less developed countries. And I think all of those, again, I, I would put those mostly in the camp of, of visual uh, barriers and that we should absolutely work on them. But again, I want to sort of move into this. Um, are there also psychological barriers that might be um, at work here? So, you know, one indication, this used to be the um, splash page that you would see when you'd come to most of Stanford's open online courses. And just, you know, for a moment, think about the cues that this might be communicating about whether I belong in this place in, and can be successful or not. Um, you, you see a quite literal ivory tower, right? Um, also a phallic symbol. Um, and, uh, and so could these cues, these visual cues, textual cues begin to help to um, either make certain people feel like they're welcome or not? And so I, I don't have, we won't get into it, but there are two um, interventions that have been, um, again, developed in face-to-face -face environments to help forestall these um, feelings of unwelcomeness, of social identity threat. One is social belonging intervention, and then the other is a value relevance affirmation, which you did a sort of shortened version at the beginning of, of my presentation. And so um, we implemented this in two large courses. Um, now you can see the global gap here between more developed and less developed countries, and then the two uh, students were randomly assigned to do these two interventions. Now they took about the same amount of time that you took to take them at the very beginning of the course. Um, they went through brief activities um, and lo and behold, um, closed the achievement gaps for those who did those interventions. Um, and we did this, re replicated this in another course. Um, and importantly, we didn't change anything about the language or the epistemology or the uh, internet access of those in less developed countries. Um, and so sort of put us on this path of understanding, yes, there are probably psychological barriers and there are also uh, interventions that might be able to, to help us that scale quite well in an, a fully online uh, environment. Um, and importantly, those who did these interventions one year later um, were more, much more likely to enroll um, in a subsequent course. Um, so we, we, you know, over a number of studies and interactions with lots of um, practitioners and researchers, we've tried to develop a, um, a framework for psychologically inclusive design to just help us think through what are the different cues that may um, affect how someone, uh, whether someone feels certainly uh, welcome in, in an online learning environment. So there's visual content that's pretty clear, the types of imagery, who's represented in that imagery. There's verbal content, everything from, you know, uh, whether it's a diversity statement in the course or the type of metaphors used, all of those things could affect. Um, visual design, so the, the colors that, we, that are used, and then the interaction. And I'll give you just brief examples of visual and interaction design. And, and I would say the interventions we used are, are an example of interaction design. Um, so here, here's an a example of bad or unwelcome interaction design. Uh, maybe you saw this as Apple credit card um, uh, approving uh, male spouses many, many times higher credit limits than their female uh, spouses, uh, partners, um, even though they, they reported the same income and, though, and, and everything else, um, a bias in the way that the algorithm um, and again, to do some equal opportunity trolling, here's a Barclay card that apparently uh, did not allow someone to be both a doctor and a female on their application. Um, again, unwelcome um, interaction design. Here's sort of a visual an example of visual design, the sort of ill-fated shrink it and peek it um, uh, campaigns that, uh, you know, maybe now a decade uh, ago that lots of um, companies were trying to employ to, you know, attract female um, uh, buyers and uh, to certain products. Um, okay, so I, I want to just move very quickly on to some uh, other examples. And there are many parts in the learning process that we could begin to intervene and change the cues that might make them more welcoming to women in STEM disciplines and underrepresented minorities. There's 
I think probably most importantly is the pipeline before they ever get into a course. What are the cues that might indicate whether I should take this course? This is the type of course for me. I can be successful in this course or this degree program. So I'll talk about a couple of examples there. Um, and then maybe uh, I'll give you know maybe one example of those initial experiences in the course, how those can be um, really important and how we can sort of manipulate some of the cues. Probably won't have time to talk about um, anything else. So let's talk about just some basic things we've done with Pipeline. Again, this is a course registration page similar to what you would see on Coursera or edX. This is our open edX instance. Um, and we have this probability and statistics course, which is uh, 20, uh, around 22% female. Um, and unfortunately, that's actually a pretty high um, per, uh, proportion of females in many of our STEM and, and CS courses, but nonetheless, not acceptable to us and not acceptable to the uh, instructor, Candace Till, who, um, you know, having females in the STEM disciplines is a very important part of, of her own research and those sorts of things. So um, what could we do at, at this pipeline point to change the cues? Um, thankfully, and I won't go into this, and, and I'll say I'll share everything that I, I have here, all of our research, everything at the end, I have a link, so don't feel like you have to, to follow along, but we have sort of uh, a lot of information now and a lot of research on the, the ambient cues, sort of subtle cues in online spaces can uh, increase participation of females in STEM um, context, whether that's the gender ratio in a conference video, decorations, the way that a course website is designed, and even gender of the people in the background of a lecture video um, leads to subsequent um, increases in female participation if they see more females just milling around in the background of a lecture video. So taking this work, um, you know, in, in really simple ways, changing the course registration page for this course from what's pretty techy, right, on the left here to an ostensible female, uh, image of a female, a little bit brighter, um, coloring, and then an inclusive statement. Um, we also, in our direct email marketing, changed um, the, the same components. Um, and since you can't randomly assign people to course registration pages, at least not currently in the platforms, we have to change it and then change it back. So the default period is uh, where it was that techie image, and then we changed it to that more inclusive image, and we see um, you know, almost a 20% increase in the proportion of females, of almost 4% uh, percentage increase of females in the course. We change it back. It almost goes back to default, and it certainly would have if, if the period was, was a little bit longer. Um, some other things we've done with, with Facebook marketing. Um, again, this is a computer science 101 course. Uh, the, on the left was the default image. Again, fairly techy. We changed uh, the, the image, or we changed some inclusive text that you, you can read here at the bottom of the screen, or we did both. Um, and again, we found uh, a significant impact that with that incl inclusive text, 15% higher click-through rate for females versus uh, when they saw the default and 26% higher, and something that we've replicated a number of times is actually combining inclusive imagery and textual components. Um, and something that is kind of a backfiring effect that some up until this point have not seen that males were negatively affected by um, some of the campaigns um, and something that we continue to, to keep an eye out and I'll talk about maybe at the end here. Diversity statements. We see diversity statements everywhere. I believe over 90% of colleges and universities have a diversity statement, whether it's on the, the application for students, applications for jobs, or somewhere else on their website. Here's, here's um, T-Mobile. Um, and so could adding a diversity statement at this pipeline point at the registration of, course, uh, of the course also affect um, uh, in, uh, in, increase in enrollments in courses? We did it in a number of courses, and this time we found that uh, you can see these number of courses, most of them are CS courses or STEM courses, um, but a three to 11% increase in the proportion of lower SES enrollment students. Um, again, didn't change anything else about, uh, about the course, but increased enrollments for those groups. Um, finally, kind of initial, this is the initial uh, you know, experiences in a course to make it more um, inclusive. And, and promote persistence for, for female and, and underrepresented minors. Oops. 
Sorry about that. We'll have to go with this. But anyway, who the representation in the uh, gender of the instructor in, in the welcome video? Um, I don't have the results quite yet to share with that. Um, and then, you know, versus ostensible and more inclusive peers um, appearing in the instructor video. Um, so I think I, I'm going long. I'll just uh, sort of conclude with some points and then um, give you access to some of the resources. And maybe we can have a brief conversation. What I would love to you to do is just think about, you know, how could we implement, um, you know, maybe changing some of these cues in courses that we're designing or programs that we're designing in, in those sorts of things. Um, but I'll, I'll just finish with these concluding thoughts. It does appear that psychological, psychological barriers exist in online spaces, even those with minimal social interaction. The good news is there's promising scale, scalable and theory-based intervention, interventions and design principles that can help to ameliorate um, some of these barriers. Um, my soapbox a little bit is that theory still matters, even in um, a, a time where algorithmic uh, pr dropout predictions and all those things are quite important. Um, that basing some of our interventions on a couple decades of research uh, and theory can be important, but we should have a bias toward action. Many of my colleagues, and, and part of the reason why some of our results are, are mixed is because we are very clear about testing these in a real learning environment. So these are not lab-based um, you know, interventions with psych, psych students who are given extra credit to be there. These are real field experiments happening in, in real courses, and I think that's, that's really important. Access is necessary, uh, but not sufficient. Um, and I think it's very important. I think others will talk today about how you know, online learning is expanding access and is absolutely important uh, to continue to do, but also how can we make these, help people be successful once they you know, get into these environments. And finally, there's a need for more precise interventions, similar to a precision health, where you're looking at the actual mechanism of, of a, a cancer cell in, in targeting that with the intervention. And this is a place where in education we should be and can be using bigger data to help us identify what type of intervention works the best um, with certain students at certain times. Um, I'll conclude with a little bit of um, humility. Uh, there's this great uh, book called Unpleasant Design. And this is always a reminder to me that much of what we're doing is kind of what this woman is doing uh, here to make this um, slightly more pleasant to her. We're not changing the structural um, deficiencies that have created these gaps in our educational system. And we absolutely need to also be doing, you know, uh, addressing this on many fronts. And I, I'm sure we'll talk about that, talk about that today, but a little, little bit of humility for some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, okay. So thank you here. Uh, the top link is probably the most important. That will get you uh, an expanded version of this presentation. Um, and then I have copies in Google Forms of the social belonging intervention and the value relevance intervention that you could copy and use um, quite easily in any course that you're teaching, designing, or, or a part of. I'd love to, you know, hear about it. If you if you want to use them, um, that would be that would be excellent. So I think I will um, conclude it there. And Patrice, if you know if we have time for a couple of the comments that are coming in, if not, we can certainly move on as well. Sure. So let, um, let's do one question and then we'll move on to our other speakers. Um, from Craig Hood, um, most adult learners and online programs might have very different responses to inclusive interventions. Who do you target if the goal is to get a maximum number of enrollees for courses with course fees and tuition? Yeah, I mean, there's there's the economic question and then there's the what's right question, <laughs> um, I think are two different ways to, um, I'll just say what we generally do, and we have the benefit of not having to worry as much about the economic situation, even though that's important, is looking at the current gaps in the course. If you have a previous run, what, what subsets of learners are not represented well in this course? What subsets of learners seem to be not persisting as well as the majority students? And then address, beginning to address those. Uh, or, or, you know, traditionally what, what we know. So th that would be um, if you have prior data, and certainly we have prior intuitions about most of these courses, um, that we know the groups that we want 
to address. But certainly, it, we can do both. We can also increase persistence so that we keep, um, you know, increasing revenue in, in these areas as well using these interventions. All right. Thanks so much, Andy. That was a really great um, presentation. And next, we will hear from um, uh, everyone at university. Well, not everyone. First, Bina. But next up, up are some colleagues from University of Buffalo, and we will be hearing from uh, Bina first. So I will turn it over to you. And please continue to type in any questions that you might have. And if you are posting anything on Twitter, we do have a hashtag. It's hashtag STEM students thrive. And it's all yours, Veena. Okay, this is Veena this is Ramurthy from uh, University at Buffalo. And you can see all my titles up there. I'm, I've been, since I talked to Patrice, I've been promoted to a professor. So I'm a professor of teaching now. <laughs> yeah, right. And also I got my chancellor's award. So thank you, Andy. That was quite eye-opening. I'm a more a practitioner than um, a theoretician in education, but it was, I took a lot of notes and hopefully I'll, I'll get to practice them. Uh, in my, uh, you know, courses that I teach. Um, um, I have some background here, but I think you can look at the slides and you can go over it. But uh, um, online learning came on my way to um, blockchain. So blockchain is, was my priority. And I was uh, running to get all the technology about blockchain on the way I hit upon uh, this blockchain um, Coursera specialization MOOC. I created it for courses. Um, it, it's a it's a very very uh, simple story. A lot of networking among women. You know, going to conferences. In one of the conferences, they said, "Can somebody make a Coursera course, online course for blockchain?" The reason why online is important is this is the hottest technology. There were no books available, no YouTube videos available. There were uh, no blogs available, and they. People wanted to learn from all over. And so I, we said, okay, I'll put together a proposal and there'll be Stanford and Harvard and Berkeley, everybody with us. So, we said, so here is a lesson to learn. You know, I found out that ours was a proposal and it was accepted, you know. So, and then I said, okay, I'll create a course, but there'll be, you know, there'll be so many others running along with us. And uh, we found out that. Uh, uh, we created a course with all of all of the people here who you will be listening a little later and um, it was delivered on time and it became a, a big big success and uh, uh, well received all over the world so just to um, answer Andy's question it is also about what you're presenting online you know and the timeliness of it is important and I think of I know that there are a whole lot of you know, people from United States learned about it, but also from you know um, Cameroon, from you know so many places that uh, this reached. So accessibility of this uh, brand new hot technology, you know, it it served them. Uh, you know, I I think it wouldn't have been done if it were a book. I wouldn't have been able to do it if it were something else. And uh, the Coursera gave them uh, or the online MOOC. Um, gave them accessibility to this technology that I found out. I don't have numbers. I don't have charts, but I think Coursera keeps track of them and the, we have them there, but it, it is a fantastic um, exposure to the technology and uh, online um, mechanism helped in this way. Oh, okay. Okay. So, okay. Left click. There you go. Okay. Moved it for you. All right. So um, now, um, to, to myself, I've been involved in STEM for a long time. I saw Leticia on, on, as one of the participants. I've, I'm involved in the local LSM, C-STEP, and other things, and I, I'm, I mentor people. And that's one way of uh, you know, socially including uh, many of those uh, URMs, um, I feel, uh, personally. But um, um, I, I was not a believer in online before, and this particular um, online course that I created made me a believer in online for inclusiveness um, uh, from, uh, you know, from the emails and other things that I'm getting. And also I feel, I just want to promote that the blockchain technology itself, unlike the Facebooks and other um, internet and other technology, it is Im implicitly, it is inherently 
inclusive technology. It goes beyond barriers. So I would ask many of you to look into the um, technology as users because um, it is meant for decentralization. It is meant for including people. And so when I look at the applications of blockchain technology, um, I do uh, uh, look at um, uh, I mean, people who are underrepresented and things that are underrepresented, places that are underrepresented and so on. It's not just people. So if, um, let me give you some examples. It's not forwarding. Okay, okay I'll do it for you. So um, <laughs> let me give you some <clears throat> statistics. Uh, right now it's about year and a half and we have about 75,000 enrollment um, people who are working on the courses. But I think the reach is much more than 400,000. I just put a very low number. Um, I just looked up 2018, it was 200,000 plus, and now it must be more than that. That means if I write an email, I don't know who they are. Uh, if I write an email, I have a reach of 400,000. I just realized that Amy, who's helping me, who's been helping me with this, we sent a mail, we sent a note, especially asking women to look into this, you know. Uh, so this is this uh, this this is a capability that online courses provide. You know, so in one one note that we sent, we said, "Women, please look at this. You know, learn it. You are going to be creating uh, new technology in this." So I think I felt so good about sending that. And here are some statistics: ten percent women, which is much lower than Coursera average, which is about thirty-five percent. And I have. Uh, so some of the statistics are very good. Like um, this is a strange statistic: one person, thirteen to seventeen, and uh, these are high school students who are taking it. And the parents communicate with me. I even met some parents, you know. And there is a one person above sixty-five. Maybe that's because of me, or I don't know. Just like Andy said, you know, put a woman in there and a woman in sixties, put it, put that in there, and people try to learn from her or something like that. I don't know about that, but. Um, that that is also heartwarming, and also um, it, um, Andy talked about accessibility. Um, I, I'm, the accessibility from all over the world. You know, I, I I keep track of it for some time. I kept track of it for some time, and then I let go because it. Okay. So let me go back. can I interrupt you just for one second? Okay. Um, um, a question from Tanya Skolby. Yeah. She asked, um, "Did you invite women directly?" Yeah, uh, directly means not face to face. In a in a in a note that I sent, I just highlighted this: is, uh, all the women out there, you know, please consider. I I just kind of pleaded with them, and I said, you may be having solutions that other people may not have. You know, it was really addressing them directly in a in an email. I can even share that email uh, with you if you want. You know, so now it's not an email; it's a note to the learners. I don't know who they are. And um, um, I did do that. So you pushed it out on the platform. Yeah, I pushed it out on the platform. So, um, you know, so uh, anybody who visited that, it's not, it, um, uh, so that, that's about 400, 500,000 people. Maybe if it is 10% of them, maybe 40,000 of them or something like that. Okay. So, and then, um, can you go back? Sure. Sorry. Okay, this is something um, I, I, in responding to Patrice's question, you know, I, I specifically included women's name. It's not any arbitrary women's name. Lisa, you're there. <laughs> Amy was, was my, you know, whenever I had a scene that I have to enact, I called in Amy, who was my manager of production and everything else. And then I also included an Allison, a K-12 teacher from Albany, who's trying to, um, uh, you know, trying hard to meet, uh, you know, working hard to meet. And sweet and things like that. And there are a whole lot of um, um, names that I included, which were, um, you know, women's name. I deliberately did that. And also, um, it's not just women. I also included places which were like, you know, behind. I think there was an earthquake in Kathmandu. I was reading about it on TV, and so I said, okay, Kathmandu, Nepal. And maybe I, if I were doing it today, I will include Sydney, Australia, or something like that. And I plugged in Buffalo everywhere I can, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and then in one of the ad libs, I just said Amherst, Albany, Albania. And then I, I had to hurry, hurriedly go before the editing is done, but the Albania still exists, you know, because these countries <laughs> will disappear. So um, I I did 
I, I deliberately did places so that people feel good about it. And I think some, in some respect, you know, people appreciated that from the emails that I get. I don't know who my learners are, but I, I do get it. And recently I have a beautiful use case. I, I feel good about it. It's about global cleanup. And I included Mombasa, Kenya. I went, before I include, I go research and make sure I'm saying the same thing, whether it's a city or a town and where it is located and things like that. It kind of uh, uh, gives me a, not only a, a technical lesson, I'm a technologist, I just do coding, that's all I do. So, but it gives me a lesson in geography and history and so on. Um, and when I evaluated the major course for Coursera, they're very strict about the coding. I, um, I asked my researchers who are technicians to check it out. I also involved um, a person, in fact, she was supported by LSAMP, Leticia, I'm just calling out Leticia, LSAMP, and I made her look at it. I got fantastic feedback from her about, oh, you should do that, you should do this. And, and so I, I deliberately go and reach out to them so that their response is valuable in reaching out to other STEM, um, I mean, other URM and um, women who are taking the courses. And also the examples, you know, I don't, uh, you know, fruit, flowers, and butterflies, <laughs> you know, blue butterflies. And I, somebody asked me about the colors. I, I got a story, if I don't, I don't want to indulge in too many stories. Uh, Coursera said, you know, when I went for training, no, no flowers, you have to wear a dark, um, a dark um, single shade or something like that jacket, you know? I did that for the first course. It was awful, <laughs> awful. And so I said from second course, third course, I wore beautiful colors, lots of flowers. You know, when I was recording in the winter, I wore beautiful spring flowers, you know, yellow, orange and pink and everything. And I think they're following the, that color code now. <laughs> you know, I told them because I'm a woman, I'm able to wear all these colors and I just want to show them. You know, I, I did some things like that, so went against the rules, and uh, it worked in my case. Okay, next. Okay, so this is um, um, how did we reach out to people to pursue career? You know, I think once they take the online course and then they drop out, but I'm seeing a whole lot of mail in my LinkedIn that says that I did this, I did that, I had a startup, and things like that. They kind of keep track, and um, we gave a whole. Uh, we, not me, I didn't do it, Amy and the group uh, went ahead and create, uh, looked at videos, papers, blogs, research papers, white papers. We added all these to the platform so that we can learn beyond what I'm saying. And, um, and I've given career advice to many of them. There's one, one of them that I want to point out and there's somebody from somewhere wrote to me saying that nothing comes our way nothing comes away. I'm in a remote corner of the world. I have an internet connection. I got into this course. I'm a teacher myself teaching. And, uh, you know, I, I learn from your course and I teach and I have all the emails. I checked and made sure that I have the emails last night. And um, I asked, him, where are you from? He said, Nawab Shah um, in Pakistan. Pakistan and, uh, you know, India don't get together, by the way. I'm, a, I'm from a, a Indian immigrant, you know. And, um, he said, there's nothing, you know. And um, I said, um, okay, where is it located? He said, Sindh province. So I went and looked up the Wikipedia and I got a lot of history and geography again. And we kept communicating. And recently he said, I want to do PhD. I have only a master's degree. How do I come to Buffalo? You know, and learn. So I told him, if you apply for a PhD, you get financial aid. And that was the last communication we had. I don't go reach out. You know, if they ask me, I respond. I'm a very strict um, limit on how I do it. And it so happened that in my recent visit to India, as I was flying out, you can see the picture. And I was looking at the, where I'm flying. I would fly over, over that spot. You know, <laughs> it, these are things that, you know, I feel it's a coincidence. Oh, this is where now I didn't, I didn't tell him anything about it, but I'm thinking that, wow, that is the place from where <laughs> that guy is coming. These are cool stories. This is just one of them. And I have, in my 30 years experience, I have a whole lot of them, um, you know, where I, I, I do encourage these URMs one by one. You know, my goal is, you know, every semester I have two people, you know, who I do, you know, who I manage, uh, you know, I, I drill them out. I don't, I don't, 
I find out how they communicate. No Facebook, no, they communicate by messaging. So I have their phone numbers in my personal phone numbers. I give my personal phone numbers and I realize that they don't get up until 12 noon and they skip meals. So I kind of take care of all these things when I mentor, you know. Um, so the, these are things that, um, you know, I think Andy can in, include in the social belonging, you know, don't talk to them before 12 noon <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. And in the community itself, I think uh, I've been involved in all of these, uh, Lerla Sam, C-Step, Nesby, why it's not, not by, you know, organizing or anything, but just um, if they send a couple of students my way, I mentor them and make sure that, uh, you know, these are minority organizations and I, 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 whatever I can do, I do that and I go to their dinners and things like that. And I, I feel the personal network, I, this is advice I give for people who are starting out their careers. I've gone through the, you know, the tunnel and I'm almost at the other end. You know, I can tell you there are three people, three more people in this table. Lisa and I have been maybe 20 plus years. And my recent one network is Amy for the past, Coursera, thank God for Coursera, the past three years. And my recent one, just a few months, is Sabrina. You know, when I have a network, this gets stronger and stronger with day. And, you know, we don't meet on any, you know, any, any, we may not even meet for years. We communicate, but then we keep in touch for important things. And I think, um, I would say in your social belonging, the personal network is so very important. And it's not just one event or something like that. And you should, whoever it is, keep it up, keep up the personal network. It helps a whole lot of um, times. You know, and Coursera lessons learned is that, I, I just um, want to say that I, I, I added something here. We translated it to, I think Coursera translates to so many languages. That means um, it, it is access to it. They don't have to worry about it. Uh, I can tell you recently, I got a message in Spanish. This is recent, last month. There's two and a half years, one and a half years or two years after it is released. I finished the first course, he said. And I didn't know what it was. I guessed it must be that. And I asked somebody who knows Spanish. And then I got a reply in Spanish and replied in Spanish, you know? So it was so... Um, uh, nice for me and, and a whole lot of people started talking in Spanish that was good and you know and I also find out that most of them use mobile phone they don't have laptops and um, so um, computing I do agree with many of the people who are in the chat that computing resources are sorely lacking you know it's not just developing underdeveloped countries I gave a talk um, it was a very hard time for me, but I made, a, made time to go and talk to a HBCU. And, um, and there I found out the teachers, 24 teachers who attended, all of them were URM. And 100%. One of the things where they didn't have, many of them didn't have good laptops. I told them, go back to your dean and get a good laptop for each one of you, you know. So, um, so I think they, and I'm going to be communicating, and this is a cold call, and I just went there expecting nothing, but it was a fantastic event. Uh, you know, I, I gave what they wanted, and we are continuing on two two pathways with the HBCU, historically um, black and, uh, universities and community, uh, colleges, you know, yeah. okay. Um, so how do you access the course curriculum material? My all my curriculum material, I have a very deep uh, footprint. Anybody can use anything. And um, I don't even put it behind the learning management system. It's available even for my students without the login. And I feel that my recent visit to HBCU, I feel that uh, they have fun. They, need, they have funds. They don't need just funds. They need a lot of scaffolding. People don't go there, I feel. you know. Um, and then I'm, I am working on private... Um, sessions for HBCU educators. Um, I give talks with engaging hands-on demos to encourage URM educators and students to pursue STEM. I do that. And uh, if you want to communicate with me, you can always communicate with me. Um, very easy. I'm, I'm an ancient one, so no numbers, no <laughs> bad characters there. Bina at buffalo.edu. Anything, anything in your mind, you know. Uh, so I've been here 30 years, so I kind of know uh, the ropes and the pipelines and things like that. Um, I, I, 
I know that Andy is doing a whole lot of fantastic work. I, I don't have any numbers except that, you know, um, uh, I, I make, uh, I, I change, I mean, I make sure that everybody who comes to my door uh, gets a good service and, uh, you know, I see them through the degree. You know, that's something that I do for, especially for the underrepresented minority. Um, I think that's about all, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let me go to the, is it, is it all or? That's your email. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else? Let me close that and get rid of this. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to um, have one more slide, which I want to promote. I'm, um, um, it's on uh, yeah, I know. Uh, okay. yeah. Chat, can you close the chat window? Oh, I, I don't have it open. Yeah, I think it's on mine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I just want to plug, uh, plug for the um, blockchain technology. I want you all to look at blockchain technology. Unlike the other technologies that came about, it's an inclusive technology. It is meant for um, involving people. Okay, it's a decentralized uh, organization. Um, you know, it gives, it democratizes, just like Netflix democratizes watching movies, you know, it democratizes technology um, and other, um, you know, things. And one of the things I find that many of the people, you are who come there, you know, I met an 18 year old who said she is trading cryptocurrency. This she is, a, well, I think I can tell you she's a ERM and she's in that HBCU university, fantastic. And so that is bringing people to STEM. Blockchain is bringing people to STEM. You know, um, blockchain does not discriminate by country, gender, where, what, when, you know, and it can help people who cannot be in the front line and to go to the best universities because of various reasons. So it can help anybody. Uh, ideally suited for digital credentialing of online courses for badges and micro credentials. And I'm, I think, uh, we are working on a program like that, and it, it, it's got and not um, you know analysis and things like that, but the credentialing part, blockchain can do a whole lot of things. And I do have an application running. I can show it to Lisa. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so uh, that is that is my role, and uh, I think um, I will look at the chat, but also um, you know um, the online experts are here. These are the next mm -hmm. panel is about speakers who are experts on online education, I hand it over to them. But before that, if you have any questions, you know, if the time is running out, please do send me email. Um, I will respond to you. And I, I believe, I, I was made a believer. I have lots of stories, but I was made a believer in online education in these last two years. I was not before. So, um, and so uh, that's where I am. So thank you. All right. Th thanks so much, uh, Bina. And yes, now we're, um, we'll wrap up with Sabrina, Amy, yeah. and Lisa. And then when they're finished, um, we will have some time for the, um, the, our guests to ask each other questions. Um, but in the meantime, please feel free to add any questions you might have to the chat box. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm glad that you're here. So as, as everyone has mentioned, there are we're, all of us at UB are in the same room here, so if it seems a little weird, apologies for that. Um, but I am, so I am a professor in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering, also the director of our engineering management program. And also, um, and a lot of things that we'll talk about here are kind of informed by um, my professional career as an engineer and manager as well. I'm here with Lisa and Amy, uh, who Dina mentioned as well, and they're going to um, talk a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but our goal for today is to give a kind of a high level overview of the engineering management program, what we've created, how this is helping to, um, what we hope anyways, is to help, help improve women who are looking to make that transition into the managerial role. Um, and we'll explain a little bit more about how we developed our program. So again, don't stress about seeing this. This is a very, we're going to zoom in in just a moment. Um, but this is an excerpt from the Women in the Workplace study that was done by McKinsey. They've done this for several years. This is the uh, 2019 um, version of it. And what we're looking at is just um, in various industries, the number or percentage of women in this study who have um, roles in each one of these different um, levels of the organization. So we're going to zoom in here on just the engineering and industrial manufacturing um, segment of this. Now, again, there's arguably a, a criticism that it probably isn't perfectly representative, 
because engineering is such a broad field. Um, so things like IT and that have their own uh, separate uh, categories, but we're gonna use this as a representation. And what we see from this is that there's really two problems. One that we're all aware of at the point of is just simply attracting women into those entry level or technical engineering roles. But what we are really looking at here now is, is not necessarily how to fix that problem, but the next problem in this pipeline of how do we take women who are, we're already having trouble attracting to this field and retaining into this field and actually get them to move into managerial roles that provide them with the opportunity and the expertise to do so. So what this, this particular study calls this is the broken rung. And so our program isn't necessarily just a you know, women specific program, but we're looking at all engineers and specifically attracting women engineering students into this program to help them make that transition and to give them the mentoring and the experiences and the support um, throughout not only our program, but kind of in a long-term sense, as you will see as we um, go a little bit further. So this is really our focus, is, is, is preparing for this transition and doing so in a very informed way um, so that we are identifying women, and in, of course, I make that as a, a statement, but of, of course, including underrepresented minorities in that group as well. And so just to give you a little bit of background about the program before we start talking about how we created it, uh, this is just a bit from our um, webpage here. Um, this program is really unique. And now this has existed for a number of years or decades even um, as a more traditional on-campus program. And just over this past summer, we've had a very concerted effort to ramp up our efforts to convert it into a fully online program to grow enrollments and to make this a very um, kind of different approach um, and have a larger impact on younger engineers or mid-level engineers who are trying to make this transition. So it's a unique program in the sense that you can do it online, you can do it fully in person on campus, or you can do some combination of those two. You can do it full-time, part-time, of course, um, and most of our students um, will be working professionals, so working in a technical engineering role and doing this program um, on a part-time sense. And so what you see on the left-hand side here is just a brief overview of some of the a content in the topics that students will learn in this program. All right, so what was our philosophy going into this and you know, how did we get started essentially? So our goal was recognizing that there are a lot of different types of students. And that means you know, male, female, young in their career, some experienced or seasoned professionals as well, uh, various industries, various technical backgrounds, or even students that don't have technically an engineering degree or specifically an engineering degree, but are working in those capacities or are managing and supervising the work of those individuals. So we had, a, and of course, we have domestic and international students um, as well. So there's a lot of different types of needs that we recognized, but above all, our goal was, you know, a superior experience for all of these students. So there was a lot of, as you can imagine, um, difficult decisions that we had to make on how to put all of these pieces together. We also knew that in our department specifically, um, we were a bit on the um, kind of amateur side of all of this. We were, had lots of folks who were kind of experimenting um, with these ideas of online teaching, but we hadn't done a deep dive from a faculty perspective yet. So this was our opportunity um, to really kind of expand our efforts, formalize the things that we're doing, and uh, build a larger um, pool of faculty who were not only comfortable with online teaching, but could also start to be, or begin to share their own best practices um, with dealing with, with some of this very technical material all the way down to some of the more kind of the, the managerial subjective types of things. Um, we also, and this is kind of an important part for the um, next two points that are here, is that you know we were very aware of what we were trying to do in the seated version or the traditional version of this program, which was emphasizing um, mentoring and experiential learning. So a lot of our classes include projects or even our capstone um, experience is a project that will be done in their workplace. So our efforts here or our, our emphasis is that we wanted to give them the kind of theoretical background and the academic mentoring but also do that in a way where it's advantageous for their career advancement and they have things that they can very tangibly show to their employers that they were able to apply the concepts that they learned in their workplace, giving a benefit, a very immediate benefit to that employer as well. 
So just as a, a very kind of <laughs> interesting or um, anecdotal bit of evidence here, um, this slide could really be titled, you know, what we did over our summer vacation here. Um, but we, um, in a very, very short period of time, were able to get this effort kind of up and running, if you will. And so in the summer of 2019, which turned out to be about eight weeks worth of time, we were able to put our internal team together, and we'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about um, the makeup of that team and what resources and uh, support were needed to make all this happen. We put the infrastructure in place, um, both at the department, the school, and the university level to make this all happen. And more importantly, we developed or recorded and edited and, and launched seven courses over that period of time. So it was really kind of an incredible effort that um, took a lot of commitment on our, our end and across various departments to make that all happen. And so since that time though, obviously from fall 2019 and moving forward, um, the support and all of that doesn't end. So we still have for our faculty individualized support um, to allow them to maintain their independence and their freedom with what they're teaching and how they want to teach it, but yet also giving them the structure and the support to do it in such a way that it translates into this audience. Um, of course, there's continual course content development and improvement. We're working on improving the scope and scale of our program, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And ultimately, you know, from a research perspective, by growing and scaling this program, it's giving us an opportunity to expand our own research interests in the world of engineering management, and particularly from my perspective, uh, women in engineering management. So what we want to focus on a little bit more, so of course, if there are questions or you want to know more details about that development effort, I'm very happy to answer those. Uh, please use the chat or you can contact me individually. Uh, but I wanted to focus for this a little bit on the outcomes, particularly from the female student perspective. So when this program was a traditionally on-campus program, it was a very small program. And by that, I mean, you know, uh, 20 to 30 students per cohort. And so our goal with this, of course, was to leverage the idea of online learning and to expand um, the diversity of our student population and from both a, a, a personal perspective as well as a, a global perspective and an industry perspective. So moving online allowed us over the summer to quadruple our enrollments. And we also see now that in the fall semester, we had a 19% of our student body was female. An important note for us is that 50% of those females took this program in a fully online capacity. So what we perceive out of that is that the, all of the, or some of the barriers, I should say, to access to care and being, or access to care, excuse me, I do healthcare research as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> access to education, um, we're at least helping to address some of those issues. Uh, again, this is pure anecdotal at this point. Um, but we know that some of the issues that women have is this idea of balancing you know, their professional aspirations with their family obligations and other things of that nature. So we are excited for the fact that we are able to at least get our kind of our baseline or our, our beginning numbers here, and we're, we're making concerted efforts to try to improve that um, to make our female population a little bit more significant. We also were able to, as we were adapting our existing courses or developing new courses for this program, to more explicitly include ideas of diversity and inclusion, particularly as they relate to managerial or workplace challenges. Um, so things like uh, doing hiring case studies where you're comparing uh, male and female candidates and the different information that's provided on there, learning how to communicate differently or to work with um, a diverse group of individuals uh, and Ultimately, what we are planning to do is to take these little um, uh, bits of information or content that are distributed across our classes and create a more specific diversity and inclusion focused course as it relates to technical product development or technical managerial um, uh, activities. And so what I want to do is for the rest of this, this is about 30 seconds and hopefully all of our technology will agree here. Uh, Fani here is one of our students who is graduating. Um, in the upcoming semester, and we just were able to get her on camera talking about a few things, and I think this is a, an interesting impact. So now I walk out onto the floor and I help people to talk to operators without there being a barrier between us. I know my place within a work setting, so I know how much or how little to ask of someone or what my tasks are. I think I'll be successful from there to work in any type of manufacturing setting or any logistics setting, you know, wherever I end up. I think I'll definitely have the confidence to go in there and, and tell them how much I actually 
actually know and help them. So I think hopefully that worked for everyone. If you weren't able to see that or if it didn't play for you, please let me know and I will share it with you. Um, but I think the interesting part of that is, is Fani um, actually did her undergraduate work with us as well. And watching that transformation from undergraduate to graduate, giving her, or and of course all of her classmates, the ability or the opportunity to do some of these things in the workplace, but pro providing additional support um, from our end has really dramatically improved that confidence in that uh, uh, her confidence not only in her own technical abilities, which are fantastic, but her abilities or her um, comfort level with being able to approach and pursue such a managerial related role. So with that, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Lisa and Amy, and they're going to talk a little bit more about the technical bits of how we made all of this happen. Thanks, Sabrina. It's always very dangerous to go off script, but, <laughs> but um, there was a wonderful editorial in the paper the other day from one of our Bills players, and of course, we're all recovering from that terrible <laughs> Bills loss, but uh, he made the point of saying that the reason the team is successful and the reason why we should all feel optimistic going into the future is because of the cohesion among the team and how basically this team really likes each other. They go bowling <laughs> together and things of that nature. Now, this team does not go bowling <laughs> together. However, we joke all the time that, that we really like each other. And it's true that we did spend our summer vacation uh, constructing all of this and it felt very purpose-driven it felt that uh, we were all on a ship working together rowing in the, the same direction so I think a good healthy work environment was really critical to the success of this mission now a couple of words about infrastructure um, before I came to academe and earned a PhD and all of that good stuff I came from a production background and I found that it's rather like riding a bicycle that uh, when I first came to UB, we were doing lecture capture. And of course, that's not the most pedagogically sound approach to, to um, building and maintaining an online learning program. It certainly goes a long way to reassuring the accrediting agencies that you're providing the same information to your um, online students as you are to your seated students, but it's not very engaging. So we were working very hard to find a way to make people comfortable when they're being recorded because nobody ever feels comfortable in front of cameras, at least when you start out. And we really were committed to um, finding a way to engage student employees. Uh, we have a, a wonderful media study program here at UB. And we reached out to the department chair and asked if he could make some references for uh, some students that already knew a lot about production. Uh, we couldn't take the time like we used to with lecture capture to teach students from scratch. We really needed some students that knew what they were doing. We also offset that with a contract with an external producer. It didn't hurt at all that he was a UB grad, <laughs> and he also has been very dedicated to the cause and taking a train the trainer approach. So again, finding that sweet spot of leveraging low cost technology uh, with a faculty friendly approach and really making sure everybody gains something, including the students who are helping to build out their portfolio and have a good experiential learning opportunity. We also are paying them a very fair wage to do this. Let's go to the next slide. So speaking of finding the sweet spot from someone who came from that video production background, professional equipment and the like, I personally could not believe how much video equipment you can now buy at the quote unquote prosumer level. So that's something that's certainly much better quality than your average video store might, might have, but it's a little bit um, less impressive than what you would find in your local television station. But to be able to outfit, to, to specify, build, and outfit a studio in less than a month for $15,000 was critical. Now, again, it didn't hurt that we had some deep roots into the community. We could call upon some friends. Again, relationships make all the difference in the world when you're, when you're under the gun to get a program launched. Um, and I think that's really all I need to say about, um, about what we did. I'm happy also to chat about any of this. Far more uh, interesting and important that you, 
that you hear from Amy and how the learning design side of this all came together. Thanks, Lise, Sabrina, and Vina. Of course, it's such a pleasure working with all of you. Uh, we have a couple of things in the chat that I think I'm going to hit on at this stage, but if not, certainly bring it back up again. We were looking to have some more conversation about the design approach that we took, as well as some of the community that we built within our uh, this particular program. And just before I get started on this particular program and the best practices, I want everybody to realize these best practices are not only for these programs that we talked about today, but we do have 25 online courses that have been developed in a similar methodology. Um, and we're pretty solid in the approach. We feel that the faculty and the students um, and our teams are able to embrace it. And again, with recognizing that continuous improvement is always something that we would strive for um, and adapt to as technology advances and other things. So uh, we're going to shift to some of the best practices to enhance the experiences of our faculty and our students. Um, these included the engagement strategies, welcoming messages, um, icebreakers that we took within the courses, descriptive qualitative learning objectives measured by our assessments, and a chunked course content structure that has a chronological flow. Um, you know, Andy talked about the Coursera platform, Nina you know, talked about it as well with her blockchain, and it does, those MOOCs follow a really nice chronological flow. You go, learners really recognize how that structure is in place. So we've carried that over to uh, the LMS that we're using for this particular program um, and have structured it in that chunking methodology, however best we could with the constraints that we have on the platform. So especially, and I'm glad Bina brought this up, but we did want to eradicate the faculty fears of teaching online and have the faculty and our administration embrace the transformation and student success of online learning. And uh, I think, you know, Sabrina touched on that also. And, and it is an extremely important message to us coming from a site background as well as education um, and business. It, you know, all of those pieces that Andy talked about and everybody else at the team's talked about so far are all super important for everybody's success. So regarding the structured content, primarily the benefits, student and faculty workload management and success are much more attainable when we do this. It eliminates everybody's need to hunt for information. Um, and so how do we do it? We provide clear, direct instructions and expectations up front. Uh, we want some of the student, the shift from faculty teaching to students' accountability on their online experience. Um, and so until they're recognizing some of those uh, best practices within the platform, we're providing support for them at any level that's, that's required. Again, as I said, we do these topical groupings um, of material so that uh, we can have some formative and summative assessments. We use rubrics to clarify assignment expectations. Um, and again, that removes some of the barriers of not knowing where to find the instructions. Rather, you can focus on the consumption of the material and content, um, as well as knowing to where to go for additional supplemental learning materials or other exposures that we also um, provide for them. And we, again, reiterate that students are on a good path to grasping materials and course success. Uh, moving to the planned student interactions, I think this is going to hit on some of the um, community, particular building that we drive for our students and our faculty as well, right? We're designing online interactions. We build that into our courses. Uh, we plan them between faculty and students, and we also plan them between our students so that they're uh, able to build the community. We want our students to not only learn from our faculty, but also from the diverse experience population that is enrolled in this, in this particular program. Um, so integrating those values and diversity of experience and perspectives is extremely important. 
Um, again, we have another roadmap, you know, Sabrina and I are kind of in that lean methodology of road mapping things. So <laughs> we're going to talk about another roadmap. So we, we do provide the roadmap for semesters. Um, again, how do we do that? It's upfront communication. Prerequisites for the course are known, content scaffolding, sharing expectations and engagement parameters rules on the platform, online discussions, and all of those things go into, into play with that. Um, we have realized that routine is key, and that is key for both our instructors and our students. The benefit of that, again, it's streamline effectiveness and eliminating backlog of activities. Uh, so again, to the point of, you know, having our faculty recognize that this is a an adaptable way to teach um, and helping them learn what that means. Um, so for instance, all assignments are going to be released on one particular day, uploaded by a particular midnight of one day, office hours, recitations in between to make sure that there's clarification if needed, and uh, moving forward. So then that comes to the LMS again, it's structured, there's collaboration on it, we use it to its fullest potential as we have it. Um, and the primary benefit of that is to monitor the progress efficiently and identify any problems that our learners might be having within each course. So again, that engagement is extremely important to us. So I hope that takes care of some of the design question as well as the community. Um, to stimulate that collaboration and concept understanding and reinforcement of our courses. All right, so I think what we'll do, because um, I know we're running a little bit long here, is just I want to skip ahead just to our final kind of summary statement here, because I think we've covered a lot of different topics in this talk. So again, any questions are, are certainly welcome. And that, you know, two kind of key things. So first off, um, the barriers to creating such a program. Like, so this program has 10 different courses to it, um, and then of course a number of or electives. So seven core, co excuse me, seven core courses and three electives. So we have more than 10 courses that we are offering. But we could, you can do this in a short period of time, given the right resources and commitment from everybody. Um, and recognizing that there are a lot of people uh, throughout, whether it's the department, school, or university level, that not only have interest in this, but that have expertise in different areas. So if you can pull together that team, you can make this happen. And more importantly, from the perspective of today's talk is that providing this type of program, we believe, is going to be able to help women who are in these, or fighting these multiple challenges or these, these competing interests, if you will, to help them manage and navigate the challenges of being able to um, educate themselves and advance in their careers without having to sacrifice home life or having to sacrifice their, their work life to deal with home. So I think that there's a, a really a lot of interesting opportunities here. Hopefully in another a couple of years we'll have some follow-up information about how successful we've done, um, but I want at least to uh, leave us with, with those two key points. And so we are done for questions provided Patrice says we have some time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much uh, everyone and we have about 10-ish um, minutes left and I'd like to also open it up if any of our speakers would like to ask one another questions um, this would be a great time for that and if any of our guests have a question you can type it in the chat box but even better you can um, turn your microphone on and camera on and ask one of our speakers yourself <laughs> One thing that I'll, I'll throw out there that I, I, you know, your presentation at, at Buffalo really made me think about is <clears throat> making courses that are welcoming and, and improving the pipeline and making sure they're not leaky. A lot <laughs> of it comes down to who is in the room doing the designing, right? Yeah. And how do we build up, whether it's learning designers, obviously, uh, diversity and faculty hiring those are really the how we change the more structural issues because you get as you see you get a team of women designing a course they're thinking about many of these issues in addressing them almost 
you know, automatically um, without having to look at the research and those sorts of things. So I think, I, you know, probably this group is very much um, exists to bolster that community of getting, you know, the right people in the room doing, doing the designing and, and, you know, ideas around bolstering that pipeline. Because as someone who's hired, you know, my fair share of uh, learning designers, it's very hard to find minor good minority candidates that um, can work in our context. Um, yeah, so. yeah, that's great. Thank Agreed. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's a great. That's a really great point. Mm -hmm. um, and a question that um, I wanted to pose. I know you talked a little bit about the design and the community, and I know that in general, um, building community, whether you, you know using asynchronous when you're in an fully asynchronous situation can be really difficult. And I, w I had a two part question. One is, um, you know, like what are some design decisions you're making with respect to the type of asynchronous um, opportunities you're including in the course, presuming that's how people are, in are interacting. And are there specific things that you're doing in order to support, you know, women, you know, kind of creating that safe space where women will will share their voice in ways that maybe they wouldn't feel comfortable if they were in a face-to-face -face situation or have you noticed that at all? Sure, so I guess there's a couple of ways to answer that. So the first part is, um, I just lost my train of thought there. The first part of the question. The design. Oh, design, design stuff, yes. So because we have this really kind of complex mix of who's in our courses, these are also, I don't think I made this very explicit, they're also cross-listed in many cases with undergraduate courses. So we have a lot of kind of um, types of students that we need to um, please, if you will. So what we've done is, is the basis of our courses are all asynchronous learning, so the lecture content, if you will, um, or the readings and other things. There is, in many cases, there's group projects or work or things that need to be done that they can use some of the community building aspects of our LMS to facilitate those discussions. And those are, um, those groups can consist of on-campus students, fully online students, you know, domestic, international, can be anyone who's in there can, can, can participate in those groups. Um, and then what we do, what we have found to have some success with is that, um, which traditional, or I should say, really started from the perspective of, well, we need to be able to provide that on-campus experience for students who are on campus. Um, so what we did was we had, you know, periodic recitation. So let's say every two weeks or so, some classes do it once a week. And it's really either a discussion group, it's a, a group activity, or it's a review of a previous case study that was done. Um, and those are you can join on campus in the classroom, it's live streamed, and it's also recorded and made available the following morning. And what we do after that is that there's some follow-up activity for those groups or cohorts of students within that class to follow up on that. So ideally students can join in person and it's basically like a very large conference call um, and everybody can contribute their thoughts that way. But if they're not able for work purposes or other reasons or they're it's two o'clock in the morning where they are, um, they can at least follow up the following day and have they have a week to continue that discussion. And that seems to be fairly effective. Um, students like the flexibility. A lot of times students are like, you know, I had to go travel last minute and I, I really love coming there in person, but I'm so glad that I could at least watch it from my hotel room the next day. Um, so that's the first part. So the second part was, you know, what explicitly are we doing uh, for the welcoming of women? So I will say, you know, this has been a bit of a, um, a sprint, but a marathon at the same time. Uh, so we haven't done nearly as much as we would like on that part. So one of the things we're working on right now, um, we've been working on community building in a general sense within this program, um, but trying to identify smaller uh, different cohorts of students or different types of students that can connect and form um, a more informal network among them for that belonging and that common shared experiences. We're definitely welcome for any suggestions anybody has on how to do that. We're still trying to figure out our own plan. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and, we'll, and while we wait to see if anyone else has any questions, I would just want to remind everyone that our next session will be February 19th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And I would also especially like to thank uh, Becky Burke and Letitia Thomas, who are my co-conspirators in this. Um, and help um, 
help immensely in the planning and organizing of these of these sessions. Thank you. And thank you. I guess I have a question, and I'm for almost anybody in the room, um, and the room being <laughs> our whole room, not just our UV room. <laughs> um, to the community building, I, I'm really anxious to try this, and to Sabrina's point, we just haven't had the time on this particular program, but um, we have had some success in instructors when they're doing online learning on the Coursera platform um, of creating a Facebook group that supports this particular program or the particular course that they're in. And I wondered if others had experience with that and could share that because it's something that I, number one, I am not even on Facebook, so I'm not going to be the best <laughs> one to, to kick that off. But um, I think a similar type of environment might be interesting for this, you know, forming a LinkedIn group or another social networking group for a particular program and how that's gotten started. Um, so if uh, anybody has any input to that, I'd be happy to hear it. Quiet group. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the next session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really, um, it's an interesting question. I know in courses that I've worked on, um, we've both tried to create a Facebook group or page specifically for the course, um, but frequently you have some participants who maybe don't want to, especially now, right, participate in Facebook, and then globally we come into issues where everybody not, might not have access. Something that I have seen is that um, our students tend to create a Facebook page on their own, or they also like to use WhatsApp. And while on the one hand, you know, we want, we feel a little bit like, oh, well, like if they're talking about things, like the faculty want to be in there to hear what they're saying in case they're, you know, going down a, you know, incorrect path. We try to encourage that. I mean, we found that those types of informal networks that they kind of start on their own ultimately really build a lot of relationships and trust and are spaces where they feel safe making mistakes, um, you know, and sharing. So it's, I, I, it's not really an answer. It's kind of a mixed bag. Um, Actually, that's more of the intrigue that I have. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, it, right. It's a constant question of what is, there is no perfect tool. Um, but I would, I, I'll, po I'll share links to a few things that we are currently exploring for a course that I'm working on. Great, thank you. Um, very, um, hi, this is Raluca. Uh, very different answer and not for a mock, but rather for a large course. And what I've used was Piazza. And that, um, uh, so, this is really a forum, but allows, um, from the student point of view, allows the ability to post something under their own name or anonymously, while as a professor, I can see who posted, allows me at least to open the space just to people who are students in the course, um, and allows tagging with the homework, uh, cross-references, and finally, the other students can answer the post and the instructor can answer the post and they are labeled differently. So basically you have a composed answer from the students and um, a composed answer from the instructor team. Um, I have no idea how it works internationally, uh, but um, at least locally it seems to work reasonably well and I know that at least on my campus, starting this semester, will be integrated with campus. Thank you. And um, it is 1.30, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, but if anyone has links or any resources that they want to share, please feel free to share them on Twitter with 
uh, hashtag STEM students thrive, or if you send them to one of us, um, they can be sent out through the listserv as well. Um, and thanks again to all of our speakers and our participants for a really great conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Andy.